It's about you. Lord, we, we live in a world that teaches us that so much doesn't matter, that all is emptiness and you live for the moment and there is nothing after that. Lord, help us to see that you are what matters. And life and death is just something we pass through as believers. One day we will be with you for eternity. And so, Lord, as we explore what your word has to say in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we pray that you'll help us to see why the resurrection means so much to us. Help us to apply your word to our lives. Not to be satisfied with just going through the motions. But to live out our faith. In your most precious son's name. Amen. I know that we don't talk about the Apostles' Creed very much, but I want to read it to you. Uh, I need to point out a couple things. First off, please understand that it uses the word Catholic in there, and the original word Catholic, remember this is Apostles' Creed, so this predates the Catholic Church by a couple hundred years. Um, this was not talking about what we think of when we talk about the Roman Catholic Church. All the word Catholic means is the church universal. It meant all churches everywhere is what it means. So when he uses that phrase in the Apostles' Creed, it's not talking about the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. It is talking about the universal church, all churches of Jesus Christ. So I want to read the Apostles' Creed to you because there's a part of it I want to focus on tonight. It says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. For thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Now guys, I don't want you to think that I am talking about the Catholic Church in the Psalms of the Roman Catholic Church. All that word Catholic means there is universal. But there's some key things, some key beliefs that kind of sums up what we believe as believers. And I think one of them is an area that we struggle with see, death is a fundamentally human problem. It is our greatest fear. In fact, it's the sum of all our fears. We have an entire industry that's grown up to help us deal with death. When a person dies, we do our best to make them look as they were not dead. I've heard someone stand by a casket and say, Oh, they look so natural. I feel like they're just sleeping. You know, I remember when my father died when I was 13. I kept looking at the body in the casket and I kept thinking, Oh, it's just, he's just faking us out. He's, it's not real. He's going to jump up from there and we're all going to go home. It didn't happen. But I remember thinking it. The reality is that those people look dead. But death is so awesome for believers, so final, so forbidding, so shocking to our senses, that we can't even say the word. We say that someone passed on, or they departed, or they slipped away. Somehow that softens the blow a bit. I fully understand the need for euphemisms when a loved one has died, and I believe the funeral industry plays an important part in bringing comfort to grieving families. But even after we've done our best to mark the rea mask of reality, death stands in stark reality. Death visits every home sooner or later. It doesn't. You don't get to skip it. You don't get to put in a note from your mommy saying, "I don't want my, my, John's not going to die this year. John can't die." Death is something we all deal with. The only ones who will not die are when Jesus returns. If we're still alive when Jesus comes back, we will not face death. Oh, we'll get resurrection bodies, but we're not going to face death in the same sense. But guess what, guys? Death is not a scary thing. Not if you really believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. So we come face to face with a question asked by philosophers, theologians, especially by grieving families. A question Job asked thousands of years ago. If a man dies, shall he live again? Consider how Paul faces the same question in Corinthians 15, 33. 
If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If the dead are not raised, then why not live it up? I mean, after all, if there's no point, there's nothing after our death, if there is no resurrection, if there is no salvation, then we might as well live to the best we can and live our lives and don't care about anybody else. See, that's one of the fallacies that people who believe in atheism never want to admit. The reality is that if you do not believe there is a God and there is no point in living, then you might as well go out and you can be as mean and as rotten and as ornery and as horrible as you want to be. Because you know what? Death is just the end. You just get put in a grave and the worms have a little dance. And that's all there is to it. Consider, you know, and, and that, you know, deep down in our souls, we want to know the truth. When we die, will we live again? Or does death win in the end? Mark it down, my friend. If we do not have an answer to death, then Christianity is just a social club. And we might as well go do something else. If resurrection is not happening, then we are the most to be pitied. And it's precisely at the point that the Apostle Creed provides positive help. When we come to the end of the creed, we find that ends on a very positive note of Christian hope. The, the phrase is, I believe in the resurrection of the body. No, not specific, that is not the resurrection of the dead, but the resurrection of the body. Older versions of the creed were even more specific when they used the phrase, the resurrection of the flesh. Christians believe that the body itself will be raised from the dead. Unlike the ancient Greeks and the contemporary Hindus who see the body as merely the covering or the container for the soul, something to discard when we die so the soul can be set free, we as believers believe and taught from Scripture that our redemption includes the body. We believe the redemption will not be complete until the body itself is resurrected from the dead. Paul wrote extensively about this truth in the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. In order to understand what the resurrection of the body involves, we need to know about three things. The body we have, the death we'll face, the resurrection will enjoy. Because it doesn't end with death. So let's look at the body we have. And some of us are like, oh man, I don't want to see this. Most of us have a love-hate relationship with our bodies. Let me illustrate. If you had the power to change your body, would you use it? Suppose you could instantly change the way you look. Would you do it? That may be the dumbest question I've ever asked. The question is not, would you use the power, but would it be a simple repair or a complete makeover? Would you say, Lord, let's just start all over again? Would we even recognize you if you could change your body? Our bodies wear out. They sag, they expand, they wrinkle. The joints get creaky. The arteries harden. Gravity pulls down everything, to every downward. The heart slows down. The eyes grow dim. The, te the teeth fall out. The back is stooped. The arms grow weary. Our bones creak and our muscles weaken. The body bulges in the wrong places. It happens to all of us sooner or later. This week, I ran across an article called 51 Signs That You're Getting Older. Years ago, I wouldn't have paid any attention to an article like that, but nowadays, I find those articles fascinating. It's helping. It helped that the subtitle is Large Print Edition. Here's a few items that caught my attention. You know you're getting old when everything hurts, and what doesn't hurt doesn't work. The gleam in your eyes is from the sun hitting the bifocals. You look forward to a dull evening. Guilty as charged. Your favorite part of the newspaper is 20 years ago today. You sit in a rocking chair and you can't get it going. It's just too complicated. Your knees buckle and your belt won't. Your back goes out more than you do. You sink your teeth into a stake and the teeth stay there. You're asleep, but others worry that you're dead. You have a dream about prunes. Okay, I've not had that one yet. Your ears are hairier than your head. When you've been over, you look for something else to do while you're down there. You know what hit me the other day? I was listening, and I was on the. I was listening to um, music playing, and I came up with this music that I remember when I was in high school. And I'm thinking, boy, I love those tunes. That's so cool. 
and the guy came on and he says, Welcome to the oldie station. We play the songs of yesteryear. These songs are really old because they're 40 years old. It's, they, they, they were first released 40 years ago. And I'm thinking, no. You know, oldies are not supposed to be songs I remember from my youth. But I'm getting old. It's part of life. One day, I'll, sh I'll, I'll leave this earth and I'll go home. And sometimes I, sometimes days, there's days when I wish I could go there faster. And the mortgage gets due, and the insurance bills are due, and everything else is due, and you just don't know how you're going to pay the bills. You think, man, God, just take me home now. But that's not something this young do. I remember when I was 14 or 13, and they took me in because I had an ingrown toenail. All right? That sounds that big to you, do right? But I was 14 years old, and I didn't want that doctor cutting on my toe. And I'm sitting there praying to God before he, while he gives me the injection to numb my toe. Please, God, if you're going to come, come now. Because I don't want to go through this. As we age, we pay more attention to things like diet and exercise. I mean, when I was 20 years old, you would have never found me saying, Well, I can't eat gluten. I have to be careful about the weed I eat. I have to eat more fruit. I have to eat more vegetables. I have to be careful the amount of protein I take in as far as what kind of protein it is. I wouldn't found myself wondering, well, you know, I need to eat more fish this week, or I need to more salad. That's something that you do when you get older. Carbs are out, fat and protein is in. So now everyone's coming up with low carb specials. I even saw a low carb ice cream the other day. That's not right. We eat ice cream because we want the carbs. A low carb Coke, that's not right. I even saw a sign advertising low-carb pizza. There ought to be a law against food like that. My question is, why did God make so much food if so much of it's bad for us? And fitness. Oh, man. We've got Weight Watchers and Jenny Craig and Kurz. We've got runners and bikers and marathoners and people who like to lift weights four times a week. And fashion is in. We're very concerned about how we cover our bodies. And in most cases, we cover up the parts we don't want anyone else to see because we're out of shape. I have a bit of news for you. Your body is not going to last forever, folks. Your body is a gift from God, but it will not last forever. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning first. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Look, guys. In death, we will all die one day. It is not a surprise. It shouldn't be a shock. You shouldn't be looking at me like, Well, Pastor Mike, I can't believe you said that. I'm sorry, but that should not be shocking. The reality is that we live in... Bodies that are cursed by sin, they're decaying. And they're going to keep doing that until one day we cross over. But here's the best part. It isn't permanent for anybody. For believers, it's going home. For believers, you get to go home says in 32, what do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beast and at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we will die. See, if the resurrection is fake, if it's all phony, if death is the end, then I don't know why you're here. I don't know why you come to church. I don't know why you read your Bible. I don't know, because there's no point in worshiping God if all you're going to do is die one day. And you're going to be gone. And you're nothing but worm food. <sighs> Most people fear death and don't want to talk about it. Death remains the final frontier that we all have to cross sooner or later. And though we all know that death is coming, we prefer to live as if we've never come at all. Suppose you issued an invitation on the following lines of friends. I've got pizza and coke, all you can eat. Let's get together on Friday night and talk about death. How many people do you think would come? 
you'd end up spending a quiet Friday night by yourself with all the pizza and coke you could have. The great playwright Sophocles says, Of all the great wonders, none is greater than man. Only for death can he find no cure. He's right about that. The wonders of modern science help us live longer, but for death itself, there is no cure. And the reality is modern science is just trying to catch up what God was doing before the fall. Before Noah, man lived a lot longer. Because God designed us to be eternal beings. So what does the Bible say about death? What does it actually say? Well, first off, death is certain, right? It is appointed for man to die once. Hebrews 9.27 Hebrews 9.27b death, death is not the end. After that comes judgment. Appointed for man to die once. After that comes judgment. Guess what, guys? We all will die one day. Now, I'm not trying to bum you out. I'm not trying to say, oh, man, this is so bad. You know, this is not bad news. It really isn't. Because C says Christ defeated death. He abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. 1 Timothy 1.10, or 2 Timothy 1.10. Got news for you guys. When you die, you go home. I came to a realization many years ago that when people ask me, pray that my so-and-so, my cousin, will not die. And that cousin's a believer and they die anyway. They look at me and say, well, why didn't God answer your prayer? And I look at you know what? God did answer the prayer. You asked him to heal him. He took you home. He took him home. Guys, believers, think about if you're in pain, you're hurting. I, I mean, I understand that. I deal with struggle or struggle with my feet and my legs. And I really wish I'm, the pain would just go away. But death isn't a bad thing. It is going home. I get to go home. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more sickness, no more any of that. You know what? In heaven, I don't have to worry about paying the mortgage. I don't have to worry about paying the rent. I don't have to worry about making the car payments. I don't have to worry about the insurance. All of that means I go home. No more sorrows, no more tears, no more pain. I'm here because God put me here. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying God made a mistake in leaving me here. But Christ abolished death, and there is nothing to be afraid in it. Death remains the last enemy you'll face, but he's already defeated. The last enemy destroyed, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 26, is death. But death is already lost. Jesus conquered death in the grave. Guess what, folks? If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have accepted him as Savior and Lord, then you'll never die. Not in the sense of dying permanently. You may cross over. You'll cross over and you'll be in heaven and you'll be in re you'll get a resurrection body and it's all going to change. What your resurrection body is, I don't know. I used to jokingly tell people that all resurrection bodies, they have two choices. They're either bald or they have living hair. I've come to realize that in the book of Revelation it talks about Jesus having hair as white as snow and it's alive. So I guess when you get a resurrection body, your head won't be dead skin cells. The hair will be alive. I don't know what that entails, but we'll have living hair. There won't be any death about you at all. Because Christ has beat it all. He did that on the cross. The resurrection takes care of it all. Most Christians, our struggle lies between three and four. Christ defeated death, and death remains the last enemy. If Christ has abolished death, why do we still die? How can death be both abolished and yet the last enemy for the people of God? The answer lies in understanding the basic nature of death. Years ago, I heard Dr. Ryerly say that the essence of death is separation. Death is the unnatural separation of the body and the spirit. That thought runs counter to the popular cult known that death is a natural part of life. There is nothing natural about death. It is the most unnatural event in the universe. According to the Bible, death came to the world because of sin, Romans 5.12. Death exists because sin exists. When sin has been removed once and for all, death will no longer exist. That's why there will be no death in heaven. In the truest sense, then death is unnatural because sin is unnatural. 
We think the opposite because we can hardly imagine a world where no sin no longer exists. But there is such a world, and according to the Bible, the world is the real world, and this one that feels so real is just... It's actually passing away. So until then, we live in an unnatural state of affairs where death still stalks our trail. But what is will, what is, will not always be. Christ truly destroyed death when he died and rose again. He abolished death as a ruling power in the universe. Death itself will one day die, and the true state God intended will be restored. But until that day comes, we live in an odd situation best described in Ecclesiastes 12.7 which says that when we die, the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Most of them have heard the phrase, ashes to ashes and dust to dust, that's where it came from. We came from the dirt and we returned to the dirt. From a purely human perspective, that's our destiny. Ecclesiastes 12, 7, it's true as far as it goes. It accurately describes what happens when we die. But that verse is not the end of the story. Because the reality is, while death remains the last enemy, Jesus Christ has already defeated it. He holds the keys, and we no longer have to be subject to its rule. Look, guys, let me tell you what. Let me tell you what. Let's look at this, what death follows death is resurrection. If death is the fundamental human problem, and that is, what is the Christian answer? This is to Paul's soaring words in 1 Corinthians 5, 51-55. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the imperishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the imperishable puts on imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Look, guys, we do not need to fear death. We go home. The resurrections will happen. The reality is it will happen instantly. The text says, in a moment, and the twinkling of an eye. One moment, the dead will be in the ground, and the next moment, they'll be in heaven with Jesus Christ. There is no gradual resurrection. It's such a thing could be contemplated. The, the great miracle will happen so fast that if you blink, you'll miss it. It will happen when Jesus returns. The last trumpet refers to the return of Christ in the air. The trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise, and living believers will be raptured off the earth to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. The thing is, the resurrection will completely transform us. In that moment, our essential being will change from mortal to immortal, from imperishable to from perishable to imperishable. Our individual personalities will remain in check, but all that relates to mortality, death and decay, will be removed from us once and for all. And you will no longer be sinners. You will be clean and pure and imperishable. That's what resurrection is. Us going home. If you think about it, it's natural to want more information. The people in Paul's day wanted more information also. But someone will ask, well, how are the dead raised? What kind of body do they come you foolish person, what you sow you does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. 1 Corinthians 15, 35-37. The reality is, if you go out to your garden to understand the resurrection, think of the process of growing fruit. You start by taking it, taking a seed that looks nothing at all like the fruit that will be harvested. You plant the seed in the ground, Cover it up, water it, fertilize it, and leave it alone. Through some process that we cannot observe with our eyes, the seed dies, and out of death comes new life that pushes up through the ground. Eventually, fruit comes forth and is harvested. You place the seed and the fruit seed by side, side and the fruit side by side. They look nothing alike, but the seed is necessary for the fruit to appear.
without death there is no fruit. Consider a tiny acorn. Hold it in your hand and study it. Suppose you had never seen an oak tree and suppose you had no idea what an acorn would produce. I submit that by studying an acorn by itself, you would never figure out what an oak tree would look like. If you cut open the acorn, you would not find an oak tree inside, not even a tiny one. There's nothing in the visual inspection that would lead you to suspect that such a tiny thing can produce such a magnificent tree. But plant the acorn, let it grow, and then come back in 50 years to see what is produced. From a humble beginning has come an amazing tree with limbs that stretch in every direction and leaves that provide a vast green canopy. Let's look at it another way. Suppose you know nothing about acorns and nothing about oak trees grow. You would be hard pressed to imagine such a mighty tree would come from such a humble beginning. Place the acorn and the oak side by side. You can hardly get them in the same frame together. One is so small and insignificant, the other so mighty and so impressive. But, and this is the whole point, the acorn contained the mighty oak tree all along. It was there all along, waiting for the right time and place to come out. How does it happen? The acorn must be planted in the ground, and it must die before the oak tree can appear. But without the humble acorn, there would be no oak tree. That's the essence of Paul's argument. Today, we are humble acorns, just a bunch of nuts. Not much to look at and not very impressive. The day will come, all must die and be planted in the ground. By the way, we talk about planting an Uncle Joe in the ground. It's not just a joke. That's good biblical terminology. We plant Christians in the ground in prospect of their coming resurrection from the dead. But that planting is not the end of the story. According to the Bible, as the acorn dies to produce the mighty oak, even so we die, and our death becomes the gateway to our future. That's our destiny. Acorns today, oak trees tomorrow. We cannot say that the resurrection body will be alike with certainty, but it will be to this life as the oak tree is the acorn. Now please don't take this too literally. I know the Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And so I can't tie all this together in a nice little package and say, I understand this 100%. But I know we'll all get resurrection bodies. Now, for those of you who are looking around saying, well, you know what? My Aunt Mabel, she got cremated. She's a believer, but now she doesn't have a body to come back to. I guess, I guess she, I'm sorry, but that's not really a problem for God. Okay. You get cremated, so be it. God's going to give you a new body anyway. It won't be the same one. You get a resurrection body. Don't ask you, don't ask me to understand it. Don't ask me to explain it, because I don't know. I used to joke all the time that we're all going to be bald with many fingernails because your hair is dead skin cells and so are your nails. They're not alive. Don't believe me? Get your hair cut. Okay? It doesn't hurt. At least it's not supposed to. If the barber does what he's supposed to do and cut your hair. I mean, I only got my hair last week. I got my hair cut last week. I didn't scream. didn't feel blood come out. I wasn't gushing. They didn't have to sew my hair closed after they trimmed it. My hair's not alive. It's dead skin cells. That's all it is. One day, one day, there will be no death. And whatever my body looks like, there will be no death in it. So everything will be alive. And what that entails, I don't know. God didn't think that was really important that I understand that. So the resurrection of the body is necessary to reverse the effects of sin. Old age, cancer, disease, accidents, terrible tragedy. These things are all part of the curse on the earth because of sin. Redemption will not be complete until our bodies are finally redeemed and changed. Redemption touches the body, not just the soul. Your salvation will not be complete until your body becomes immortal and imperishable. That clarifies a crucial understanding about the saints who are already in heaven. Sometimes I hear people say things like, Oh, we know he's up there playing football in heaven. Well, not without his body. Football's a contact sport. If you don't have your body with you, you're not going to play much football. It's not correct to speak of our loved ones in heaven as already having their glorified body. If the body is still in the ground, it's not glorified yet. Better say that the spirit or soul is with the Lord and that they are in heaven, like us, on earth, awaiting the day of resurrection, of the return. Now, I know that gets confusing. And I know people struggle with that. But your loved ones are not in heaven playing football. 
even if they had their glorified body, they're not going to be in heaven playing football or fishing. People get this idea that heaven is just you goof off all the time. That's not. It, the, the best part about heaven is you're with Jesus. <sighs> body that is raised will be a new body. Not just the old one patched up. If a loved one dies of cancer, it won't do any good to be raised with cancer. Personally, I don't want a renovated body. I want something brand new that doesn't wear out or run down. A body suited for... I don't want to live in this old cranky form for eternity. That'd be like driving a Studebaker for the rest of my life. I don't want a Studebaker for eternity. Okay? I don't want a Studebaker body. Individual personality continues to resurrection. We believe in resurrection, not reincarnation. If I come back as a Chihuahua, I'm going to go bite someone on the ankle. It's not going to happen. It won't come back as someone else or something else. If I'll be raised as Michael Boyd, with all the distinctive marks of sin removed in all the parts of my being, the parts of me that annoy other people will be gone forever. Thank God. What remains will be Michael Boyd, cleansed and purified and perfected by the grace of God. I will still be me and you will still be you. We will also be like Jesus because we will see him as he is. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. And we will have new bodies fit for new people who will live in the new Jerusalem. I have heard people speculate that we will all be 33 year olds in heaven because that's probably the age Jesus was at when his crucifixion. The Bible doesn't say that, folks. And I doubt the earthly makers of markers of age will apply to our resurrection bodies. I heard a man say that just as we have five sins today, we'll have 500 in the resurrection. I don't know if that's true. It does fit the acorn, acorn oak tree analogy, but it's just an analogy. You know, God didn't give me a manual to say, "Well, this is what your man, this is your, this is what your new body will look like." Our only way of understanding the resurrection body is to discover, to consider the experience of Jesus. After he rose from the dead, disciples could still recognize him. He bore on his body the marks of his suffering. He ate and drank with them, yet he also appeared and disappeared from their midst suggesting that in his glorified state he transcended time and space. And we know that he did, because he's God. God transcends time and space. He's not limited to time and place. You know, that's the biggest drawback Satan has. Satan can't be everywhere at once. He's limited to one time and one place. And so because Jesus Christ can be everywhere all the time, Satan has no power over him. Now, I can move, I believe it can move really fast where it wants. And that's one of the things that will get me upset when people come and look at me and say, well, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. Your sin made you do that. Satan can't force you to do anything. He can tempt you and deceive you and trick you, but he can't make you. You can't make you sin. You do that all on your own authority. When God saves you, he saves all of you. Every part of you is saved, and every part of you will be delivered from sin. Here is my one whole sermon in one sentence. It is not soul salvation we believe in, but complete and total salvation. The resurrection of the body is the final step of our salvation. It's kind of three steps. Step one, we're saved from the penalty of sin. That happens when we first trust Christ. When we become a believer, we are saved from the penalty of sin. It happens when we first trust Him. Step two, we're saved from the power of sin. That happens day by day through the new life given to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you're not there yet, neither am I. But we're getting there. We're being, we are saved and we're being saved. And we will be saved. And we are saved from the presence of sin. That will happen in the future when our bodies are raised from the dead and transformed by God's power. I ran across this the other day. During the Middle Ages, theologians held extensive discussions about the precise nature of the resurrection body. Here is one question they discussed in detail. Suppose a missionary is eaten by a cannibal, and then the cannibal dies. When his body turns to dust, whose dust is it? The missionary or the cannibals? To which I reply, whoever asked that question had too much time on their hands. I'm reminded of Augustine's famous reply to the question, What was God doing before he created the universe? He was creating hell for people who ask questions like that. There's a serious side to that frivolous question, however. 
We know that many people were incinerated on 9-11 when the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center, collapsed. Their bodies simply vaporized. How will God resurrect the bodies of believers who died that day? Or believers whose bodies were lost at sea or in the jungle? The answer is, in all cases, it's the same. God. He does it. God holds every molecule of the universe in his hand. Can retrieve the right ones, the right time of resurrection finally arrives. It's not a problem for God. Think of it this way. If you can raise the dead, you can raise the dead. The circumstances of death don't delay or deter the Lord in any bit. Everyone who died a believer will be raised immortal. Death will not have the final say. We are sown in dishonor and raised in glory. 2 Corinthians 15, 43. 1 Corinthians 15, 43. Dishonor describes our condition at the moment of death. Because our bodies begin to decay the moment life ebbs away. Glory describes what we shall be when Christ returns and we are raised from the dead, from dishonor to glory. That's our destiny. How will God do it? Paul says, I'll show you a mystery. Even he doesn't know for certain. The best arguments in favor of resurrection are simply analogies. We are like little babies in the womb who hear voices on the outside and see light shining into the womb. We know as much about the resurrection body as that little baby knows about life after birth. What we know is wonderful. The reality will go far beyond anything we can possibly imagine. And I think we can't miss the greatest point Paul makes. Oh grave, where is your victory? It's gone. Oh death, where is your sting? Resurrection of the body means that when God saves us, He saves every part of us, body, soul, and spirit. It also means that we will see again our loved ones who died in the Lord, and it transforms how we view death. If we truly believe that God has said, why should we fear dying? Death has been so thoroughly defeated that the moment of death has become the moment of our personal victory through Christ our Lord. It is mere incident in the ongoing life we share with Christ. This is not pie in the sky dreaming, folks, but biblical truth. We know it is true because it rests on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because he rose, we shall rise too. When Benjamin Franklin was 23 years old, he wrote an epitaph for himself. This is actually on his gravestone. The body of Benjamin Franklin, printer. Like the cover of an old book, the contents are worn out. The, spirit, the script of its lettering and gilding lies here, food for worms. But the work shall not be lost, for it will appear once more. In a new and more elegant edition, revised and corrected by the author. He was right about that. We will one day rise from the dead, revised and corrected by the author himself, never to die again. Death cannot ultimately touch the person who is joined with Jesus by faith. Take comfort, brothers and sisters, in the affirmation of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body. I pray that God will grant His children great faith and hope and deep joy as we move forward to the great day of our resurrection. I pray that he will help us to stand strong and to abound in doing good because we know our work is not in vain and we say it with all the saints, even so, Lord, come quickly. Let's close in prayer. Father, we pray for those hearing this voice, hearing these words. We pray that they will come to know your Son, the Savior and Lord, that one day, We'll see them in resurrection. We'll know them in heaven. And we'll celebrate each one that you live there. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, grave, where is your sting? You're gone. My God has taken care of it all. I'm not coming back as a gopher. I'm not coming back as a dingo or a sheep or a cow. We will come back in sinless, resurrected bodies. But even so, come quickly. Even 
hands. Rotten body.